discussion on NFED half waves. Um, and we'll turn it over to Peter. Very good. Well, there's, uh, there was a request of, for some information about NFED half waves, and I found these very uh, fascinating, but uh, unlike uh, Ken and, uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, Doug also says he's played with his, so uh, they've got probably as much or more experience than I have. Um, um, uh, Al, uh, Al V6DE has won, uh, won my antennas, and it's been pretty successful for him. And uh, what I thought I would do is, um, uh, first of all, to uh, show you what uh, my conclusions are going to be, and we'll come back to that. Uh, I am going to use uh, two presentations, um, one uh, which is a, a PowerPoint effectively uh, on PDFs. The other is, a, uh, is a, a video by Steve Ellington. I hope I can get that to play because these guys are just, they've done so much work on it. And uh, to pretend that uh, you know more than they do about it is, is, is kind of foolishness. So this is um, just a couple of pages. Um, what I... Uh, what I will do is we'll go through the presentations um, uh, made by other people. Um, and we'll, you know, these are comments um, on the, uh, uh, what I consider most important points, the background, uh, where the thing came from, the infant half wave versus what a lot of people call a random length antenna, um, how to match the antenna and uh, the transformers that are typically used, which is, uh, there's an awful lot written about that. Um, the lengths of wire that you would choose for it, how you'd build the box, um, the uh, choices for core uh, ferrites, et cetera, and the winding of them, uh, just some of my comments on it. And then um, questions and answers, like how do I hang the antenna? Does it need a counterpoise? And is an end fed antenna noisy? So. Those are the uh, those are the topics I think we'd like to look at. Um, so uh, right now, what I'll do is um, we'll go over to this particular video. Um, this particular video, if we can see what it is, maybe what I got to do here is uh, make it smaller. Um, I will include this video. You can see the URL at the top. This fellow's name is Steve Ellington. And um, he has, uh, he started taking apart some of these uh, transformers and that that were available and kind of at his own expense, you know, sawing them apart and seeing what was inside. And it was kind of a secret as, uh, almost as to what was going on. The very first were the PAR NFED Z. Uh, I think PAR is now sold by uh, Vibroplex. But they were very expensive, but very popular, very effective antennas. And since then, they've been uh, copied, and uh, and now they're made by all sorts of people. Myantennas.com in uh, Netherlands, I think, is a very popular, very good one, but very expensive uh, by the time you get them here. So um, uh, what I'm going to do is to play a bit of this. And uh, Pat, I think uh, for the uh, purpose of copyright, um, for these two presentations. So this will be followed by K1RF's uh, presentation, which is a PowerPoint uh, thing. So uh, uh, just in the, in the uh, since I did not get um, permission from these fellows to, uh, to do this, I'd like you to pause the thing now. Talking about using two or three toroids together. Uh, are they wired in parallel? Is that how it works? Uh, no, these are just glued together, but they're only one stacked up on top of the other to get more core material so that you're kind of spreading the flux and the, and the power up between the cores. And of course, it makes the wires longer, so that causes some conundrums. But yeah, no, I, that's a good question. Yeah, just more cores. That just means kind of making a thing bigger. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, I had a question about the wire. What gauge of wire do you use to wind the toroids if you want to go up to 100 watts? I, I, I think, Brent, um, that that is not critical at all. Uh, if you look at that presentation, that last one, uh, he's got some recommended, there was a little chart on recommended sizes, and I know you built one, so we should get your comments there at the end, because uh, I want to see how you made out with yours. 
Um, but the, uh, the, you know, the wire is, I think we had a little discussion on that, but certainly a hundred Watts, uh, you don't need anything bigger than number 18. Uh, I wouldn't think, I mean, you could go to 16, I guess, but uh, there's no real need for it. It's going to carry that, you know, couple of amps. So, and what about the antenna itself? Is there like a minimum, uh, gauge that you would put on the antenna itself? Well, one thing I was reading, and, and I think it was Tom, uh, WHA, reminded me about this, that if the antenna is extremely thin wire, um, it's going to have a higher impedance. So um, that's why some guys are using the 64 to 1. So they might be up to 3,000 ohms, where is if you had your antenna out of tubing, like it was made out of, like, I don't know, like, like half inch or three quarter inch aluminum, then uh, the impedance is, at the end is going to be a lot lower. So... Um, yeah, thin, thin wire is going to give you more loss, but uh, again, it's for portable, it's a trade-off. And uh, I saw one guy, he was happy with stainless steel uh, downrigger fishing wire, but uh, I, I don't think I'd go there. I mean, it's nice wire and it's braided and really flexible and kinks like a sucker, but, uh, uh, you know, stainless wire is a very poor conductor. So uh, I, I think just the most rugged kind of wire, if you can get yourself some of that uh, uh, silver, silver plated, uh, you know, flexible Teflon wire, that would be the ultimate uh, portable wire, I think. And, uh, and what gauge would that be? Would that be in like a 20, 22, 24? I would think that would be what you'd be shooting for, for portable. If I'm making a, a permanent antenna installation, I'm a firm believer in using that, uh, you know, seven strand copper clad or something, uh, my big loop at the cabin is uh, number 12 uh, copper plated steel. And I'll tell you, those trees are up 60, in some cases, 80 feet, and they sway back and forth. And uh, it takes a lot to break that wire. So if you're putting something up permanent, use heavy wire. Yeah, I'm looking at portable operation. So you'll, you'll find did, out pretty quick. Who um, did Malin make the winder? Because that's another thing. Unless you've got a 3D printer, uh, uh, getting at winders, you have to buy them from soda beams or something. So uh, researching winders uh, took me an evening, another evening rabbit hole. No, Malin had it on a cardboard. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was Ken that printed the winder for me. Or it is, there is a template. And, um, and uh, I have it somewhere if anybody wants it, but uh, there's guys who are making them, there's Aussies, they're making out of coroplast. And uh, I don't know if you know what that stuff is, but uh, if you think back to all our political campaigns and uh, these people's names planted on it, it's a plastic corrugated uh, material and apparently it works pretty good for winders. Well, Jim and Pat have 3D printers, so there's a business opportunity for you guys. <laughs> Pat saying, "No, no, I'm busy enough." Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I just got a 3D printer. Oh, and this is one of the reasons I just got a 3D printer because there's so many different parts that I want to make that I can think of, and even since I've gotten the 3D printer, I can think of more and more things that I want to make with it. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's like for, for something for spilling up your intent and stuff like that. That's great. I was thinking of using PCB, right, and, and doing something. Um, like what Peter is showing, because I've, I've been, I, like my main antenna, it's an NFED half wave. And it, it's a 64 to one on that I won't bound myself. Went to Home Depot, got, got a PCV um, uh, electrical box for, drilled some holes in it, put it all together. And, and, and that's the thing, it's a lot of the information I got on how to do this came off of Steve Ellington's um, uh, channel there. And I mean, I'm also an electrical engineer. <laughs> so it's like, it made, <clears throat> made a lot of sense to me on, on the way this works. The only thing is, I don't know. It's like, I, like, like um, Peter was saying about going with, uh, you know, two turns on the primary versus three turns. I did the three turns. So then I had 24 turns on the secondary. And I'm actually, I got to experiment with this a bit. Maybe I'll go back um, to the two turns and only the 14 instead, because I'm not sure. I, I think there's some loss in there personally. Um, I'm more of a digital guy and an analog guy, not an RF guy. So it's like, 
this is one of the reasons I, I did get in amateur radius. Like I wanted to explore the whole RF end of things. Uh, but I'm thinking, it's, and and I've I've got two of them. One one I've wired as a transformer. One I've wired as an auto transformer, right? So, and and one I've used like a, what what I got a, a 240-43, and the other one I've got three 240-3s stacked together. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking it's like okay, I got to experiment with this more. I just haven't had a lot of time lately, but. Uh, and you know, I, I get a, I, I'm getting on 80 meters right now. Uh, I did something similar with the antenna trap near the end there, with just a couple of meters of wire after that. So I, I get, you know, I, I, I get uh, 40, 20, and actually th that's the thing. Those are the two primary bands outside of 80 that I'm interested in. But 80, I'm finding it's a very narrow tuning bandwidth, very narrow. Like I actually tuned, um, so after I was done getting the, the, the 40 meter and further up tuned, after the intent trap, then I went and tuned for the 80 meter. And there's a particular net that I'm on here that's at 3.975. So I ended up tuning that end for 3.975. I'm very, very close to it. I get great signal with it. But as soon as I'm about 50 kilohertz either way of it, then my, my standing wave ratio is like, it's, it, well, it, it goes exponentially out of uh, two to one, right? So yeah. anyways, that, that, that's my current experience. I probably could talk a lot more about it, but. That's great, Steve. That's, or that, that, or that, or Doug, sorry, Doug, that's great experience on the, um, uh, and of course, this is true of 80 meter antennas, whether you got a dipole or not. And uh, of course, if you put any loading in an antenna, it gets even worse. So you're really exactly. lucky to get, exactly. you know, you're really lucky to get, uh, you know, 50 kilohertz or 75 kilohertz on, on 80 meters, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I mean, that, that, that's the thing. It's like, if you think about it, it's like, so I've got, I've got 20 meters of wire, then I got a trap and it's, um, like you're saying, like that's the thing I was looking. I was actually aiming at the 110 microhenries, and I did the calcs, and I took some P, like I had some PZ, P, uh, PCB pipe. I did the calcs for it for the diameter and everything. The the size of the wire. The wire is 14 gauge, and I, I you know says so like came up around 77 turns. So I did the 77 turns, but I guess it turns out my LCR meter. Is either too cheap or the battery's dying in it. Because it was telling me it was, it was only 80. I'm like, nah, I can't be that far off. Okay. Well, I don't know. I think 75 would be just fine. Right. Yeah. So I took a few wines off of it, but it works. It works. Yeah, but the yeah. thing is, you know, I ended up with, yeah, it was about two more meters of wire. If you think two more meters versus another, you know, 20 meters of wire on that. Right. Yeah. I got a good yeah. deal out of it for my. And of course, and of course, this is why you're even more narrow is because you're loading that antenna, and of exactly. course that that just cuts your bandwidth right down. So exactly, exactly. That's good. So, that's great. That's uh, that's good experience, and that's the real ham radio bit. Uh, well, I'll finish this. Um, <clears throat> and I'll finish this uh, conclusion here, and then uh, then we can add more questions if we want. Um, we had, we had uh, one, one question Warren wanted to ask before you go on. Okay, yep. Oh, just a quick question. Uh, is there any deterioration in these uh, toroids over time? And just uh, wondering how long they last. Um, there shouldn't be worn. They're a centered material. They're basically a ceramic. Um, the, the damage that can come from high power once you get up to the Curie point I think if you do overheat them, you get really, really hot there. I think that uh, they don't come back. Um, and uh, this is talking really, really hot. We're talking, uh, you know, like uh, 300 degrees C or something like that. So uh, uh, as far as I know, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're impervious to weather. And uh, uh, some people worry about sharp edges on the wires and all that. Yeah, if you've got really high voltage uh, and arcing between turns, you're worried about that, then fine. But uh, they should last forever. Good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the uh, just the conclusions and some notes that I've made. Uh, um, there we go. It's working. Um, 
So as we said, just to summarize all this stuff that we looked at, um, the whole idea of NFEDs started with the, uh, the, the, the Zeppelin and the antennas on the balloons. And uh, uh, just to, for a bit of amusement and for uh, your, uh, your, your entertainment, think about the idea of a hydrogen balloon and a spark transmitter on a hydrogen balloon. <laughs> um uh, or any kind of rf on it and so that was the real impetus to say let's put a feed line out there not let's just don't just don't just drag a wire off the end of the balloon let's put a feed line out there with this little tail of an antenna so the actual rf the zap and the zap and doesn't get to the zeppelin you know what i mean and go kaboom so kind of amusing <clears throat> well maybe not so amusing so my coined uh, coined uh, i coined a phrase tonight i guess uh, I, and I can remember, this is my piece of humor, I remember when that $2 coin came in, and uh, I don't know, I guess everybody simultaneously thought of it, you know, because we had the loony, well, of course, it was going to be called a toony, and I said, well, that's to phrase a coin, if you think about it, so anyway, so this is uh, phrasing a new coin here, it's uh, Efner, and uh, the infinite half wave is resonant on the band of operation, it's going to give you a high impedance, a very high. Uh, there's an Aussie in the States, or in a, an Aussie down uh, VK2, I think. And he has a really good video on, on making an NFED vertical. Uh, same idea. And how to use, um, how to use uh, the compensating capacitor and that on there. And, oh, before I forget, this Aussie used a piece of coax and some of these transformers, instead of the compensating capacitor being a physical capacitor, it's just a piece of RG58. Of course, it makes a capacitor and it's a really good high voltage. So there's no reason to go to the radio store if you don't mind chopping this uh, chunk of RG58 up and making a capacitor out of it. So you can do it that way too. Um, the NFET NR is often called a random wire antenna, the random length one. And the NFET random width is chosen to avoid quarter and a half wavelengths. Now, if I, I think I found it while we were talking here. Um, here is uh, one of the charts that uh, is around. And um, this uh, so-called random wire antenna is an NFED and um, this guy did some MATLAB fooling around to get to, in void lengths, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and so he's also done, this is the ultimate chart, I think. So uh, it'll take an evening to digest all this, right? So uh, let's say, okay, let's say I wanted to run 80, 40, 30, 20, 15, and 10. So let's go with D purple. So D purple, D purple, well, here I am down here. So these are all possible lengths, I guess, that I could choose. And uh, I don't know, ones are better than the other, but there you go. Um, one thing to remember, and um, I guess, I think I'm kind of remiss at not mentioning it. How many lobes does a dipole have in its azimuthal pattern? So you look down on a dipole from the top, how many lobes does it have? Well, of course, it has two lobes, right? One front and one back. Well, if you go to a one wavelength antenna, how many lobes does it have? It has four, right? It is a clover leaf. So if you go to, to two, uh, if you go to three half waves, then you're going to have six lobes. If you go to four half waves, you'll have eight lobes. So you'll have all these kind of little lobes like this, like like that. And if your DX station happens to be in a notch between the two lobes, you're not going to hear them. So that's one of the prices you pay. And that is also true about these 43 foot verticals. So uh, you get to the higher bands, you get some strange things happening with your, uh, with, your, your, with your overhead nulls. And you may not hear stations at certain angles. So um, that's one of the things there. So anyway, that's the length chart. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to get this stuff as a reference here afterwards. We'll see if we can post some of this cred for you. <clears throat> and um, how do we match the antenna? Well, the old days, open wire and a balanced tuner. Um, I want to make a comment that there is another antenna called um, a half square antenna. 
And what this is, is a quarter wave up on both sides and a half wave across. It is two quarter wave verticals in Fed, but the current maximum is at the top instead of the bottom. So these are awesome antennas. But where you feed it, if you feed it at the bottom, it's just like an N-fed half wave. And what you can use, and one of the simplest tuners, is just simply a parallel resonance circuit. Now you need a fairly decent um, capacitor, but all you need is a parallel resonance circuit and you don't need this transformer. And that parallel resonance circuit is almost 100% efficient. So to think that you've got to use this uh, 49 or 64 to one transformer, it's it's only convenience. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time with uh, with a conventional, a more conventional antenna tuners, and uh, I'll try to show you one what it looks like. So, so normally um, you you could go directly to a radio, and I, any of you that have KX2 or KX3, they have awesome tuners in them. Um, uh, Wayne uh, Wayne Burdick there he he uh, suggests uh, this uh, Wayne's magical forty three foot wire and this works for I think forty meters and on up it'll work you know a KX three you don't need this you, you, you really I you know I would really like to know if if Ken I think he has a KX three I would really like to know uh, if if these antennas are any improvement on just this chunk of wire you know that you can use with a KX three so especially when you're going to lose a whole crap in this forty nine to one transformer. So the non-resonant uses a nine to one, a good transformer, very high efficient. A true NFED half wave, which is much more predictable. You know the length you got to use, it's resonant. Um, you can check it with your SWR bridge on the other side of the transformer, um, but the transformer is not very efficient. So you gain, the, uh, you gain and you lose on this one, okay? So which one is better? Um, I can't say. Um, I do have a comment from a guy, and uh, I I'll see if I can present that to you. Um, <clears throat> the wire lengths, uh, we, we, uh, we mentioned this, half wave length for the NFED, and many lengths here. Uh, in construction, you don't really have to have that waterproof box. You don't have to tape the core. You, you don't have to have insulated wire. Um, uh, and but you really should provide the protection to the core. You don't want to whack it on a rock or something. Uh, and I don't think I would allow to you know to snow to to sit on it or to get really really dirty. Uh, you know, especially if you're in a salt uh, environment, I'd watch that. So, oops, uh, I'm scrolling. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, oops, there we go. Sorry. Um, the core choice, we've looked at that. You can go back to the chart. I won't uh, reiterate that. Uh, <clears throat> the winding, um, some people say you need to twist that primary. Um, another guy who is a very, very outspoken uh, mathematical genius, but he likes to overanalyze everything, I think, is Owen Duffy in, 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 uh, in, in Australia. But Owen Duffy uh, has made a trial transformer, a very thin wire, and it looks very successful. And it doesn't look like this design at all. His comment is this is only one particular design to, to solve the problem, and he's very right about that. So, <clears throat> um, so back to the questions and, uh, and, and answer, answers. I think this is the most important for us. So how do I hang my antenna? Well, <clears throat> I might just uh, have it attached directly to the rig. Uh, but don't forget, your rig or you is going to be a counterpoise. So if it's a small rig, maybe no problem. But if it's a bigger 100 watt radio, uh, it might start biting you back. You know, you're, uh, you might find some tingling on your microphone or something like that. You get a bit of RF. So uh, counterpoise is probably a good idea. Steve Ellington showed that if you can just put a moderate ground or moderate counterpoise right at your radio, uh, you're good to go. Um, you may want to uh, ground ground mount the transformer and have the line go up and out. Again, uh, ground that and you're, you're good to go. However, if you want to put the thing up on a roof, and um, this is what Al V6DE has. He's got a virtually a three-story house, and he's got about a 15-foot mast on the top of that house. 
And uh, that's where the transformer is. And it goes out over a tree that's about 60, 70 feet high and then goes to a two-story garage. And it's a full length 80 meter antenna. So that I consider what should be just about the very best NFED uh, half wave uh, configuration. So <clears throat> counterpoise, uh, Moxon in his book says you can do it with a 0 0.05 wavelength counterpoise. Uh, you want to know more about this stuff, I can point you in the direction. Um, and, and we will or need a counterpoise. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can put a feed line choke where you want it. Uh, I'll show you a feed line choke, simple one. <clears throat> and uh, if part of your feed line is to be the counterpoise, that's cool. In other words, maybe you want to... Uh, Maybe you want to use a coax barrel connector and ground it at that point, or maybe you just want to put a feed line choke in it. But from the choke back to the radio, maybe you want that to be quiet. So if you're putting one of these outside and you don't want the noise of your air conditioning and all your wall warts and everything else to get in your house, then put a feed line choke somewhere outside and uh, you know stop that noise from coming in. <clears throat> Finally, here's a very good, kind of I thought this is a, I kind of, uh, in some ways, poke fun at uh, some of us uh, thinking about antennas. You know, oh, verticals are noisier. This antenna is noisier. This antenna is quiet. Well, how can an antenna be quiet or noisy? It, it's not the antenna that's noisy. Unless you got bad connections, how could an antenna be noisy? The point is, does the antenna pick up noise? Well, um, some are more prone to noise pickup. Um, some verticals, because some there's vertically polarized noise, then yeah, you can get more noise on those verticals. But again, if your antenna is close to the noise, if you put an antenna in your attic, you're going to get it. I mean, it's, it, it, it'll work, it'll transmit, but boy, it'll receive it all the crap too, right? So <clears throat> NFEDs are very prone to feed line radiation and reception. Um, this is called common mode current, and uh, it gets onto your coax shield. And what we need to do is use a feed line choke to prevent it. Um, and the last slow slide here is uh, you can see a very simple common mode choke in the upper corner. This is actually neatly one wound one, but all you got to do is even four or five or six turns in through. Uh, and here you don't really have to be that scientific about the ferrite you, you know you can you can probably get by with junk ferrites or uh, I've used some uh, some TV yokes and that and they actually perform pretty well as uh, feed line chokes in the in the uh, HF region you've all seen these balance line chokes like this guy that are in uh, all of your switch mode power supplies if you look inside them uh, on the AC line they always have these there and uh, <clears throat> so the current we're trying to get rid of is this so-called I3 current. You know, you've got currents going, you know, on the, uh, on the inner conductor and on the inside of the outer conductor, but you don't want them on the outside of the outer conductor. You don't want them on the outside of your coax. So if you, if you put enough inductance here, um, then you can get a pretty doggone uh, good uh, common mode choke. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a chart by uh, G3TXQ, um, but he does show uh, the, um, uh, you know, all the multiple types of chokes that you can have. And, uh, and uh, it, it actually is probably not, um, uh, not really a very, uh, a, 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 a very good choke to just wind it out of the coax. I mean, it will work, but... Uh, uh, I've just got to drop this a little bit so I can see here. Uh, scroll this down here. Uh, if you search G3TXQ, Steve is dead, but uh, G3TXQ chokes here, um, common mode chokes. Uh, this is still, I don't know who's keeping his website alive, but this is just absolutely awesome stuff. Um, and this core, this this uh, setup chokes here, and shows you all your common mode choke impedances and eight turns of RG58 on 243. You want this black line and you want green, so <clears throat> this is pretty good. Um, <clears throat> this is an excellent range over here, for example. So you can you can pick the choke uh, chokes you want to make, and uh, uh, 
Yeah. Well, any further questions? Peter, um, uh, on uh, an outdoor setup, let's say you're doing uh, summits on the air, why not just use a, uh, uh, a ladder line rather than coax? Absolutely, uh, ladder line, um, ladder line to, uh, you know, to a good tuner. Um, that's uh, about as good as you can get. In fact, you, you know, really don't need to worry about all this stuff. Uh, um, you know, you can, you can use virtually almost any length of line and get away with it. Is Ken here? Ken? Yeah, yeah I've, been, I've been here the whole time. <laughs> Ken, you're the expert on uh, these hand-fed antennas because you've used them. Well, that doesn't make me an expert. That's one of the reasons I suggested this topic because there's a lot about them I don't know, but I put, we have some practical experience with them. A lot of the soda guys kind of started off using mostly inverted Vs, uh, which work great. You know, dipoles, they're wonderful, but they're a little more prone to, to get entangled up when you're deploying them. And uh, we keep running into a problem with there not being enough real estate or unobstructed real estate on the top of a soda hill. So you end up, you know, bending one leg of the dipole at an angle instead of running it out nice and straight and so on. So particularly with anything above, you know, you're trying to get to a uh, band uh, like the 40 meter band or the 30 instead of, you know, the 20 or higher. Um, an end fed is really attractive because like you said, there's just a single support. So you can either use a soda pole or you could just uh, use an arborist throw weight and chuck the end of it over a tree branch and run it back to yourself. And you don't need that much real estate for an end fed half wave on 40 meters compared to you know, deploying uh, some other options. So it's been, it's, they're really good for that. And as you pointed out, you can use your coax as the counterpoise. And we often do that. You just have a short length of coax and you, you uh, uh, run the, uh, the end fed, you know, the high end is in a tree and then you run it as a sloper down to the top of a hiking pole, you know, and have your transformer just, you know, mini bungee to the top of the hiking pole and a short length of coax that just runs down onto the ground and into your, into your radio and that acts as the, as the counterpoise. And uh, it works pretty, pretty well. So Ken, are you using the uh, half wave tuned or a more or less random wire? Oh, tuned. They're all, yeah, well, I think most of us are using, using tuned unless we've got uh, really, you know, high capability tuners that are portable enough. I don't, I never carry a tuner. So it's just got a four, one of these 49 to one transformers, you know, uh, and that's all it needs. And what bands do you operate on? Well, the, the, the NFED I use uh, works on uh, 40, 20, uh, and, uh, and 15, and allegedly 10. I haven't tried it on that yet. But, uh, you know, as, as Peter pointed out early, one of the joys of these things is if you cut them to the right length, uh, you can, you know, uh, play with these harmonics and get dips, you know, in the, uh, get nice resonance points in uh, in the in you know the 40 meter band the 20 meter band and and so on and uh that's that's the joy of it you know one antenna will do you know three four bands and uh just with the one transformer uh you know there'd be a little bit of variability in in what your swr is as you go across them but uh you know as long as you can kind of keep it below two to one then you can get away without carrying any kind of a tuner at all uh, up the hill. And in my case, I have an 817. So it doesn't have a built-in tuner like a KX2 would. So that's that's the trick of it. Um, I was going to ask Peter, though, like I, the one thing I'm not that clear on is what, what parameters, what adjustments do you make in order to maximize your bandwidth? Because as you pointed out, uh, it can be tricky to have the thing resonant you know, if, if you want it resonant in the voice portion of the 40 band, then by the time you get up to 15 meters, you're like too high, you're out of band. And then, well, if it's, but if you want that not to happen, then, then you got to make it resonant at the bottom of the 40, like in the CW zone. But I found, I got this one uh, in-fed antenna kit from an outfit in Holland recently. I forget what the, the name of it is, RF kits or something like that. And I was just surprised and delighted when I built this, that I don't know what it was, the, the beefy toroid they gave me or whatever, but the, the bandwidth was fantastic. 
So even though I made it resonant at you know, only um, the very rock bottom of the, the 40 meter band at, uh, oh, I think, what was it? 7.05 megahertz. The thing was still below uh, a two to one SWR at, at uh, 7.3. So you're nice all the way up into the voice band. And, and it was also so broadbanded, but by the time I got up into the 15 meter band, it was below a two to one SWR across the whole thing. Yeah, that's the way, that's the way they should work, Ken. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's anything that you can do uh, to uh, specifically to, to broadband them. You certainly can pick the frequencies where your multiples are, like I'm talking about, right? Yeah. But yeah, the my, the my antennas one, um, which uh, is uh, uh, actually, where, 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 where is that here? Um, the My Antennas one, oh yeah, it's P PDF here. So the, this is the one of the My Antennas one. This is the box uh, and this guy is fairly, fairly pricey. Uh, well, it's $120, but you, by the time you get it here, but those are very good. If you don't feel like buying one, uh, definitely they're, uh, they're a doggone good box uh, to, to buy. Um, this other little tuner, this is something that, you know, if you ever grab one, if you, you don't have a tuner, Ken, I've got one of these little ZM2s and they're amazing. They got the little red light in them. They're what they call a Z match tuner. And, um, they're uh, they're a really cute little guy, and and the guy just about virtually gave it away at the, one of the flea markets, and I knew what it was. So, if if you if you ever get onto one of these, um, and you can match virtually anything with this. In fact, I think you could run your NFED right onto this thing. It has balanced terminals. It's a true balanced tuner, and uh, you know comes out as uh, that the other side. So, uh, is that, Peter, is that one where you tune for minimum uh, brightness on the LED? That's exactly right. I um, use this on my IC705, and a funny story was uh, I've got that big horizontal loop up 60-something feet, and um, my IC705 I was too lazy to plug in the batter or plug in the uh, the power supply, so I was running on 10 watts, and um, and I, I I hadn't actually tuned it in, so I was actually off resonance, so. And I had left it in the tune position. So I was probably running half of 10 because it was on the load. Because you've got to remember to switch this off because it's got an absorptive load in when the light goes on. So you tune this for the light to go out. And uh, so I hadn't even tuned the darn thing in. So I was running two or two and a half watts and I was still getting 5.7 to 5.8 into, into Calgary from BC with, uh, with my big antenna. So <laughs> kind of funny, really. <clears throat> Thank you. That's a good tip. I'll uh, I'll keep an eye open for that. There's another. You can still buy them apparently online too. I saw one the other day. It was uh, it was a kit. I think it was forty dollars. Uh, yeah. and it, uh, had the same principle. I forget. Yeah, what... it's called it's it's called a Z match, and uh, they were. Um, they were uh, very, very popular in Australia, but I think this is pretty well the culmination of the uh, ZM2 toner. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're kind of getting over time a little bit. Any more questions for, for anyone here on, on uh, NFED antennas or comments? I wanted to... Uh, Thank Peter for a great presentation and clarifying a lot of ideas and, and uh, some good tips and also uh, some very good comments from a lot of you. Uh, it's been a, a very educational evening. Thank you for that. Um, I also want to ask uh, a question of the group. Uh, one of the um, things that 